Hi, this is George Graville, and I want to read to you a chapter out of, from the book Stuff, subtitled The Fortunes, Foibles, and Fiascos of Those Who Sought to Understand Matter. This is chapter 13, titled One Electron Universe, and subtitled An Electron Joke. Well, we'll see. Since you believed all the crazy behavior of electrons described in the last chapter, we thought we would see just how gull gullible you really are. If you can believe everything in this chapter, you may not have a complete outer shell. That's a chemistry joke. In 1965, Richard Feynman received the Nobel Prize in Physics for his work in quantum electrodynamics. We'll try to describe that later. When they hand out prizes, um, they make you give a speech about how grateful you are and how you couldn't have done it without your uh, co-workers and your mother. In Feynman's speech, he told a story about a phone call he got from John Wheeler in 1940. Wheeler was one of his university professors. Uh, here is a picture of uh, John Wheeler teaching. The story began like this, and this is Feynman speaking. I received a telephone call one day at the Graduate College at Princeton from Professor John, Professor Wheeler, in which he said, Feynman, I know why all electrons have the same charge and the same mass. Why? Because they are all the same electron. The professor went on to explain his hypothesis that a single, electro a single electron is passing back and forth through time. Sometimes it passes from the present to the future, uh, as we do, and sometimes it comes from the future and it goes into the past. There are some problems with this idea, but not nearly as many as you might think. To really explain this, uh, we will have to talk about the concepts of parity, antimatter, and time reversal. First, let's take a break and talk about Wheeler and Feynman. They were both brilliant physicists and worked well together. This seems surprising when you consider how different their lifestyles and personalities were. Wheeler was refined, mild-mannered, and incredibly polite. His only marriage lasted 72 years until his wife died at the age of 99. Richard Feynman was another story. Whereas Wheeler was a Christian, Feynman was an atheist. His, mar his married life was the opposite of Wheeler's. His the first wife died of tuberculosis a few years after their marriage, and his second wife, second marriage ended in divorce. When not married, he seemed to have a steady parade of girlfriends. Some he met in Brazil, a place he loved to visit. He also loved to play samba music. People say he was very good playing the bongos. Here's a picture of uh, Feynman playing the bongos, and then uh, later you'll see a picture of him teaching. When Feynman was working on the top secret atom bomb project, Feynman thought it was a good joke to break into his co-workers' safes, the top, where the top secret papers were stored, and leave them using notes. He was able to do this by guessing what people might use for a combination. His abilities at math were simply amazing. He had a standing bet that no one could propose a math problem he could not solve in his head. He never lost the bet. Perhaps one of the re one reason they got along so well was that they had one thing in common. They were not afraid to consider wild ideas. They were both good at preventing conventional wisdom and common sense from influencing their thinking. Wheeler was one of the first to propose the existence of black holes and is sometimes given credit uh, for coining that phrase. A black hole is a place in space 
that pulls everything into it because the gravity inside is so strong. Here is an artist's idea of what a black hole looks like. Even visible light can't escape from a black hole, so you can't actually see them. See that thing over there? I don't see anything. Right, it must be a black hole. Wheeler also proposed the existence of wormholes. Here's a picture of what a wormhole might look like. These are sort of tunnels uh, from one time and place to another time and place. They're especially useful to science fiction writers. He also proposed the participatory anthropic principle. Get ready for your head to spin. This is the hypothesis that the universe would not exist if we were not here to observe. That is, our observation creates the universe, past, present, and future. Try not to lose uh, sleep over this. Feynman was also interested in human consciousness. He pursued this interest by conducting experiments in which he experienced various states of consciousness. We had better not go into the details of these experiments. Although he didn't completely buy into Wheeler's one electron universe, he did find the idea of time reversal useful. Let's return now to the one electron idea, but first we need to explain some things, mostly peculiar things. First, there is antimatter. A particle of antimatter is the same as a particle of matter, but with the opposite charge. So an antimatter electron, called a positron, is exactly like an electron, but with a plus charge. In the one electron universe, electrons are traveling from past to future, and positrons are traveling from future to past. As Wheeler said, all positrons and all electrons are exactly the same except for the charge. If you think about it, it is a bit puzzling why the gazillion electrons in the universe are all identical. And Wheeler's hypothesis suggests an answer. Going back to the phone conversation at the beginning of the chapter, Feynman's reply was, but John, there are a lot more electrons than positrons in the universe. John's answer was something like, well, most of the positrons must be hiding somewhere, <coughs> which led most physicists to assume that this was all a kind of joke on Wheeler's part, or maybe not. More about antimatter. There is such a thing, and there isn't much of it, and it can be isolated and studied. This is tricky because you can't let antimatter touch matter. If an electron meets a positron, all their mass is converted into energy in the form of high energy electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation. Usually the laws of chemistry and physics are the same, but <clears throat> for matter and antimatter, this is called C symmetry, C for charge. But sometimes the symmetry fails. For a while, it was thought that all you had to do was add left-right symmetry. This is called P-symmetry, P for parity. This makes sense. The laws of science are the same for left and right-handed people. Taken together, this is CP-symmetry. Then someone found a nuclear reaction that didn't even have CP-symmetry. The answer was to add time-symmetry, T, which means that nature doesn't care which way something is traveling in time. The laws are still the same. So there you have so there have been no violations of CPT symmetry. Back to Feynman and his quantum electrodynamics, QED. <clears throat> this theory describes how light and matter interact. This was the first theory that agreed with both quantum mechanics and relativity theory. This was such a big deal that they pretty much had to give him a prize. What is interesting is that a lot of what Wheeler said in that 1940 phone, phone call ended up in QED theory. Feynman didn't buy the whole one electron universe idea, but he did use parts of it. 
he included time reversal in his calculations. He also said that an electron traveling backwards in time is the same as a positron. We will close with some quotes by the, the two characters in this chapter to show you how they really did share the same crazy brilliant view of the world and their role as scientists in it. The first, Wheeler. If you haven't found something strange during the day, it hasn't been much of a day. Feynman. You're unlikely, unlucky. You're unlikely, I'm sorry, to discover something new without a lot of practice on the old stuff. But further, you should get a heck of a lot of fun out of working out funny relationships and interesting things. Wheeler. Time is nature's way of keeping everything from happening at once. Feynman. Things on a very small scale behave like nothing that you have any direct experience about. They do not behave like waves, they do not behave like particles, they do not behave like clouds or billiard balls or weights on springs or like anything that you have ever seen. Wheeler. In any field, find the strangest thing and then explore it. Feynman. Nobody ever figures out what life is all about and it doesn't matter. Explore the world. Nearly everything is really interesting if you go into it deeply enough. Wheeler. Behind it all is surely an idea so simple, so beautiful, that when we grasp it in a decade, a century, or a millennium, we will all say to each other, how could it have been otherwise? How could we have been so stupid? Feynman. I believe that a scientist looking at non-scientific problems is just as dumb as the next guy. Wheeler. The universe does not exist out there, independent of us. We are inescapably involved in bringing about that which appears to be happening. Feynman. Some people think that Wheeler's gotten crazy in his later years, but he's always been crazy. You might want to look back at chapter two and reread what ancient Buddhists thought about atoms. Their ideas have some, th some things in common with Wheeler's one electron idea. Those ancients thought atoms had no existence in time, but appeared to us as they passed through the present. Also, their conception of reality was similar to Wheeler's suggestion that the universe is created by our observation of it. Finally, go back to chapter 12 and compare Schrodinger's cat to Wheeler's idea that simply, something only becomes what it is when we observe it. That's quantum mechanics for you, just one disturbing idea after another. In the next chapter, we will stop worrying about electrons for a while and look at the swarm of particles beyond protons and neutrons that make up the nucleus. And that next chapter, chapter 14, is called Stranger and Stranger, or what the stuff that stuff is made of is made of. Now if you scroll down below the uh, YouTube screen, you'll see a link to a place where you can uh, buy the book, look inside the book a little bit, uh, read the reviews, and find out a little bit about me if you really want to. Um, and then also, in the bottom right-hand corner of the YouTube screen, there should be a uh, place you can click um, that lets you subscribe uh, to my YouTube channel. Well, that's all. Uh, that's all for today. Bye. Wash your hands.